Hey everybody, how's it going? I am your host, Adrian, coming to you almost live from lovely Petaluma, California, here in Studio MC3 at Quicksurf Internet Studios. Linux News Log is a proud member of the Tech Podcast Network. If it's tech, it's here. Do feel free to head on over to techpodcast.com and check out all the other technology-related shows as well. I'd like to encourage everybody to visit us online over at quicksurf.com. Please do subscribe to the show if you have not already done so. For those of you who have, thank you so much for subscribing. And with that, let's go ahead and get into uh, the stories for this episode. Uh, starting off over at Network World, smooth like BTRFS inside Facebook's Linux-powered infrastructure. The BTRFS creator showcases Linux's open source storage. Uh, Facebook engineer Chris Mason is unequivocal about the primacy of Linux in Facebook storage infrastructure. He says if it runs on a computer and it's storing important data, it's running Linux. He's speaking at the Linux Enterprise End User Summit on Monday in New York, joined Facebook just six months ago in order to spearhead the social network's move to BTRFS, usually pronounced ButterFS. <laughs> yeah, ButterFS. Uh, the Linux-based file system that he created in 2008 while working at Oracle. It's a massive undertaking. Uh, he cited some statistics from Facebook's Look Back video project that helped to underline the scale of many Facebook plans, 11 petabytes of storage, a peak outgoing bandwidth rate of 450 gigabits per second. I mean, you know, this is Facebook. How many users do they have? Uh, what's more, the pace of work at the company is often breakneck. The code behind the main website itself is updated at least twice a day. Uh, projects there move very fast. Very soon after I joined, they had a selection of machines carved out to run BTRFS. So the ability to automate much of the management work involved in the storage infrastructure is crucial. Um, if they can't automate it, they're obviously not interested because largely a lot of this is they've just have such a huge volume that you know, it, they have no choice but to automate it. It's, it's that simple. So anyway, it's an interesting read. Definitely uh, look into it, uh, you know, especially if you use BTRFS um, or ButterFS as, <laughs> ButterFS, as it's called. Uh, I'm personally, I'm not a ButterFS user. I prefer ZFS uh, on FreeBSD. And so that's my, if, if it's important and stored on a computer here at Quicksurf Internet Studios, it's stored on ZFS. Uh, and FreeBSD. So anyway, uh, the next story is from the Inquirer. Opera build Opera for Linux arrives with a premier uh, Chromium build. So Opera Software has released the long-awaited Opera 24 web, web browser for Linux. So if you're an Opera fan and you want to be able to use it on Linux, this is your chance. Uh, the developer builds build marks the first Linux version of the Opera browser that's based on Chromium. Uh, writing on the company blog, developer Ar Ar Arjun Van Leeuwen said, adding Linux to our browser line fulfills an important part of Opera's vision to, make, to shape an open, connected world. We want everyone to have fast and safe access to the web. Adding Linux opens up that possibility to more machines running the open source operating system, which is great. Uh, I used to be an Opera user a long, long time ago, um, way back in the day when I still used Windows. <laughs> and uh, it's, you know, it's it's not a bad little uh, web browser. Um, you know, it's just one of those things where I, I just kind of got away from it because they, they had trouble keeping up with the times, if you will. So anyway, definitely check it out, um, especially if you're an Opera fan. You know, it, it can make your life simpler um, you know, it does have some nice features, you know, they do try to differentiate, so definitely go check it out. Um, from PCWorld.com, Linux gaming revolution continues as XCOM Enemy Unknown hits the hits Steam OS. The mass migration of big name AAA games to Linux has conti continues uh, as publishers rush to have top titles available for the 2015 launch of Valve's Steam OS operating system. 
Uh, Feral Interactive announced that the blockbuster XCOM Enemy Unknown is now available for Linux, as is all of its add-on content, including the large XCOM Enemy Within expansion. So if you are an XCOM player, uh, definitely check this out. The base game is $30 on Steam, while the complete pack with all the add-ons being sold for $50. Um, you can get it for $750. Um, now that the Steam's massive summer sale has kicked off with the complete collection for $16.50, but once that's done, that's done. So uh, definitely uh, check that out. Should be pretty interesting. So how many of you have an Amazon Fire TV? I have one. It's I love it. It's wonderful. Um, I ran across a story over at lilyputing.com, uh, Fedora Linux running on the Amazon Fire TV. Piques my interest. Uh, now that it's possible to root the Amazon Fire TV, it's possible to do some pretty funky things with Amazon's $99 TV box, like replace the operating system with Fedora 20 Linux. Huh, imagine that. Uh, that's what developer Rob Clark figured out how to do shortly after the Fire TV launched, but up until recently, it would have been tough for anyone to follow in his footsteps since it wasn't easy to root the device. Well, now it is easy to root the device, and once, you've, once you're able to root the device, installing Fedora or another operating system still takes a little bit of know-how, but it's a lot easier. So I, if, you, if this is something that you want to do, and I may actually check this out because I have an Amazon Fire TV, um, there's a YouTube video uh, you can check out, and uh, this is pretty cool. Definitely uh, look into it, especially if you want to run something else on your Amazon Fire TV. As usual, all of the disclaimers and don't try this at home type stuff applies. There's no endorsement of this from me. So if things go horribly wrong, don't blame me for it. It's your fault. From uh, the nextweb.com, LG opens WebOS Smart TV Platform to developers. This is pretty cool. Uh, LG is out to persuade uh, developers of the merits of its WebOS Smart TVs after it released an SDK for the platform, announced at CES uh, in January of this year, which enables third-party apps to be built for it. So they... Uh, bought the WebOS patents and source code from Hewlett Packard in 2013. Um, it supports Windows, Mac, and Linux environments and works with a range of standard coding technologies. Um, the smart TV space is increasingly competitive. However, LG says it picked WebOS because of its history and origins as a developer-friendly platform. Uh, they're fans of the user interface that LG has put on WebOS, but it remains to be seen whether it can convince developers to put their efforts into a platform that is less visible than that of rivals like Samsung. You know, I, frankly, personally, I'm not a huge fan of the smart TV. I would very much rather have a little box, much like the Amazon Fire TV or a Roku or an Apple TV or something of that ilk uh, plugged into my TV than then have all that stuff built into the TV. The TV is a display device, and one of the things that really just gripes me to no end is manufacturers that spend money adding features like smart TV-ish stuff to a display that would you know would be better off if they spent that same amount of money improving the quality of the display you know for example a display that doesn't that cannot display a full eight stops of dynamic range i cannot tell you how many tvs you can put a full eight stops of dynamic range on on the tv i cannot even begin to tell you how many tvs have trouble displaying that uh same thing with contrast brightness image resolution uh adjustability color accuracy color gamut i mean it just goes on and on and on the state of tvs is getting better but has historically been particularly with flat panels pathetic and you see manufacturers trying to sell new tvs by adding all these cool whiz bang features when i would rather they spend that same amount of money that they spent on those cool whiz bang features giving me an a, a, a better display because nine times out of ten the vast majority of people they don't, they, you know, 
A, it's half-baked. They're a TV company. They're not an app developer, right? So a lot of the stuff, it's, you know, the smart TV aspect of it is just really chunky. It's not well done. It's half-baked. I would very much rather have that money and, and energy and resources spent giving me a better display. I digress. I've gone completely off the rails, but that's my position on smart TVs. Uh, that doesn't mean that LG can't make a box that has, you know, WebOS on it that you can plug into any TV. But, you know, in terms of, you know, smart TVs in general, I'm not a huge fan. Okay. Uh, for, from Korea IT Times, Element 14 launches the Raspberry Pi Compute Module Development Kit. Uh, Element 14 has launched the latest in, in its extensive development kit range, uh, the Raspberry Pi Compute Development Kit to allow design engineers to harness the power of the Raspberry Pi for embedded applications. The original Raspberry Pi has now sold over 3 million units worldwide with applications ranging from a child's first experience of computing through to space exploration. Many great examples are available at Element 14 Pi projects. Increasingly due to its low cost, high performance, and stable support package, many design engineers are incorporating a complete Raspberry Pi unit into their end design with uh, significant interest in using the Raspberry Pi in industrial and embedded applications. The logical next step is to provide engineers with all the benefits of the traditional board in a flexible form factor to support embedded design, hence the development of the Raspberry Pi compute module. I might actually get one of these. Uh, I've got a couple of ideas for some things that have kind of been in long development and I've been waiting uh, for the right embedded platform or you know, an easy to develop embedded platform. I'm, you know, I do embedded Linux development professionally at work, but it's all software running on top of uh, boards that, that are designed by a you know, whole other entity. Uh, you know, so I've been kind of trying to find a platform that's general purpose enough that I can do some uh, uh, development work for some product ideas that I've got uh, that, uh, you know, would be pretty awesome. But, you know, it's been, I've been having a lot of trouble come finding it in an embedded environment that's got enough horsepower, computing horsepower, and or is in a form factor that's easy enough for me to separate out the stuff I don't need in terms of hardware, because there's so many of these, it's just got a bunch of stuff hardware-wise that I don't need, and it's missing hardware stuff that I really want. Anyway, um, should be pretty interesting. I'll be looking into that. From, uh, let's see here. Oh, I've already talked about that. So, all right, so that's it for this edition of Linux News Log. As always, thank you so much for watching and uh, listening. Please do subscribe to the show if you have not already done so. For those of you who have, thank you so much for uh, subscribing and supporting the show. And with that, I will see all of you on the next episode. I'll see you then. Bye.